When I say that the very best keyword research tools are free, that is not an exaggeration. It's because I honestly believe that these free tools are the best keyword research tools. So if you're spending a bunch of money on other tools, yes, they have features and things that you can do that these other tools may not do. And so they may have some value to you there, but a lot of you are probably overpaying. So I'm gonna show you these free tools and I know that as I show them to you, some of you are gonna say, yeah, but just hang on <laughs> because I'm gonna answer some of your questions. All right, the first tool that we have to talk about because it is the most accurate keyword research tool on the planet is Google Search Console. We're gonna take a look here. This is Google Search Console for Cook for Folks. Now, I'm gonna deal with the elephant in the room and sh talk about these traffic swings. This is just looking at the last three months. Back in September, we were coming out of helpful content update and this website was just flat. It didn't see any ups and it didn't see any downs. It just kinda coasted through helpful content update. And then for some reason at the very end of September, we actually got a solid jump. We basically doubled our Google traffic, organic traffic. These are just the web clicks, just overnight doubled. And then it rose and rose and rose and rose. And then we had this drop off. Well, what's up with that drop off? Well, let's look at the timeline. This is November 22nd. That was the day before Thanksgiving. <laughs> this is a website about cooking for large groups. We see a spike like this every year at Thanksgiving. We also see a little bit of a decline right after because right after Thanksgiving, nobody is thinking about cooking for large groups until Christmas, at which time we're gonna see another spike that won't be nearly as big as Thanksgiving was. That's what's going on here with the traffic, but that's not what we're looking at today. We're looking at Google Search Console as a keyword research tool. What we wanna do is we wanna look at the performance report. Now, some of you here on the left side, you might see something that just says performance. You might see something that just says search results. I have this discover here, so it kind of, it breaks it out for me. It's because I get a little bit of traffic and some impressions from Google Discover. Don't worry about that. You can click on either search results here, or if it just says performance, click on that, or just from the overview page, just click here in performance on full report. They're all gonna take us to the same place. Here I see that same graph again, except it's showing me total clicks and it's showing me impressions. Now the impressions is lower than clicks because they're on a different scale. So this lowest line is 250. Over here for impressions, the lowest line is 13,000. Totally different scales. So that's why, in fact, this is what's one thing that's really interesting. My rankings went up, my clicks went up, but my click through rate went down a little bit. That just goes to show that before this latest change, that latest algorithm update where we actually jumped in the rankings, we were getting a high click through rate. We just weren't getting that many opportunities for people to click on us. Our content just wasn't ranking as much. Since we're being shown much more often, the click-through rate goes down, and that's a pretty normal thing. I'm giving you like all sorts of other information about Google Search Console. That's not the point. Okay, I'm gonna click on average position as well, because those numbers then will populate here in this table. Okay, this is the gold mine right down here. When I click on this queries tab, I see all of these search queries that I'm ranking for in Google. These are the actual things people are typing into Google that my content is just showing up for even if I like never get clicks. This is where we have a huge opportunity. We click here on impressions and it'll sort for us. And we can see these search queries where we're getting seen a lot. And if we're getting seen a lot, it means that search query is also getting searched a lot. And if it's getting searched a lot, there's a lot of search volume for it. When I look and I see ones where I have high impressions, but very few clicks, I see that as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to either take an article that I have that's already on point, but just not ranking that well or getting very many of the clicks, as well as to find ones where maybe my article isn't right on point for that search query. But now I know there's a search query getting a lot of search volume and I can write that. Now, one of the reasons I love this approach is because what it does is it allows us to take the search queries we already have that we're already ranking for, and it allows us to create additional supplemental content that is closely related. When we create content that's closely related to the content that we already have, it fills out a content cluster and builds more topical authority. If we just look for dozens of keywords that are spread out across our entire niche that aren't closely related to each other, then we don't build any topical authority. And over the last few years, that's become really harmful for websites. In fact, that's the number one factor that held this site down and actually hurt it quite a bit. A few years ago, the traffic was growing steadily and then all of a sudden overnight, it lost about half of its traffic and then leveled off and stopped growing. That's because we basically answered a few search queries, put some variations around there and wrote it a hundred different times. No topical authority. Anyway, I digress, back to keyword research. So here's where we have a huge opportunity 
And you would say, all right, cool. I see all these, these opportunities here. Now I need to do some analysis and figure out which, which ones of these and maybe some of these overlap with each other. Maybe I have more than one Brussels sprout search query in here and I need to see how they tie in together. Let's save ourselves some time, shall we? There's a tool for that and it's free. It's called AI. Specifically, we're going to look at harpa.ai. If as a content creator, you are not using harpa, it is time to start now. It's free. So let's go check it out. All you do is you click this button. It's a free plugin. It's a free Chrome extension, actually. It's going to show up right here. Looks just like that. See that? Cool. What that does is it allows us to take these AI models that we have, ChatGPT, as well as others, and use them on web pages that we're on, which is pretty awesome. So I'm going to go back here and I'm on this page. Now let's open up Harpa. Now, if yours looks a little different than mine, there's this little button right here. This one shows me um, I just, I check the button and what it does is it shows me all these AI commands that are like built in. It's got all like here, I just click all. It's got so many things. I can have it look at a page and tell me what keywords it thinks that page is optimized for. I can have it look at a YouTube video and have it give me a summary, either a high level overview or like an in-depth summary. It's so cool how much it has. In fact, I can look at a, an article and ask it to give me a TLDR. So as content creators, it's just a shame to not be using Harpa to help us understand things that are happening. But I'm going to give you a specific prompt to use right here that is going to help you. So first, what we have to do is we're going to expand this to give us all <laughs> of these search queries um, as big of a list as we can. And we're sorted by impressions here. OK, then we're going to do chat with page. Now we're going to use this prompt. Make a list of all top queries on this page with at least 500 impressions and fewer than 200 clicks, but combine queries that mean the same thing. ChatGPT is going to do a couple of different things. I'm using GPT 3.5 here because that's free for us. But sometimes what it'll do is it'll group these queries and give me just a total number of impressions for all the queries that mean the same thing. Here I got an output where it just grouped all the cheesecake ones together. And so I can see all of them right next to each other. Either way, I it's done some analysis here and grouped them for me. And that's what's really cool. But now I can take it a step further. And I can say, please give me an article idea for each of these groups of queries that has a, that has total impressions of at least, I'm going to say 500. You can change those numbers to be whatever makes the most sense for your website and the amount of impressions it's getting. Now it's actually recommended to me some specific articles that I could write that would cover some of these search queries. It's a great way that you could do keyword research and not have to put a lot of analysis or thought into those specific search queries. Honestly, even just looking at this, I can identify really quickly that I have an opportunity here. When I click on this, how many Brussels sprouts per person, and I see which, what, what, what page is it that's actually ranking for that? I can see how many Brussels sprouts for a crowd. It's literally an article that's supposed to rank for that. And I'm not ranking that well, and I'm not getting very many clicks. So it's time to make a change to that article. I can recognize that as a, new, a huge opportunity. I can also go back to those queries, look at that entire group sorted by impressions. And I can see that there are going to be others where there's just huge, huge opportunities. And I can make a list of those and I can just either update some of the articles I've already written to make sure that I'm answering those questions really well, or I can identify opportunities to write new articles. That's why I love this keyword research tool. But like I said, some of you are going to try to poke a hole in this by saying, OK, that only works if you have an existing website. Yes, that's true. If you have an existing website that's at least ranking for one thing, that's what's required here. I just did this on a pro my Project Double Time website. The Project Double Time website has 64 posts on it. That's not a lot. 25 of those were lit written in literally the last five weeks. So they're not really ranking for a whole lot quite yet. That means I have just 39 posts, realistically, that are really even doing very much on Google. And it doesn't have a ton of traffic either. And yet, even so, I was able to identify more like 20 articles using the method I just showed you with Google Search Console and ChatGPT. But what if you are just getting started and you need that initial batch of keywords for that? You could go to a keyword research tool and it would point you to the exact same search queries as it's pointed everybody else that's in your same niche. Or you could just use your brain, use a little bit of Google and 
get a little bit of help from the AI. So we're just gonna go straight back over to ChatGPT. For that, we just go to chat.openai.org. If you haven't created a free account yet, just go do that. Everybody should have one at this point. You could also do the exact same thing with Google Bard. So let's pretend that I am starting the website cookforfolks.com, but I have no content yet. And all I know is I wanna start a website about cooking for large groups, but I don't even know where to get started. You may say, Ricky, I've heard you say that you should take the main topic and break it into at least a few high level categories and maybe just pick one or two of those to get started with and maybe break some of those down into subcategories. And that way we can start with just a few of those subcategories and build some clusters of content in there and build topical authority. But I'm having a hard time breaking my topic down. I don't have a whole lot of creativity there. Well, you could start with a prompt like this. I'm starting a website about cooking for large groups. What are some top level categories I should include? Well, let's see what ChatGPT has to say about that. Wow, it says recipes. It thinks that should be the core of my website. That's because that's what everybody else does. I may choose to ignore that piece of advice and just have recipes as a supplemental aspect of my website because beating out all the other recipes on Google is actually really hard. <laughs> meal planning, okay. Offer guidance on meal planning for large groups. Tips on portion sizes, ingredient quantities, and make ahead recipes, wow. So portion sizes, well, that's something that actually Cooker Folks has down because that's like what half the articles on the whole website are about. So this actually helps me as I categorize the content that's existing on Cook for Folks because it makes me realize that I should group all those articles that are about uh, how much to make into group meal planning. And it means that I can cluster those articles with other articles around maybe the same kinds of food or maybe the same kinds of events, but I could cover things like ingredient quantities and I could also include some make ahead recipes. Cooking tips, we absolutely have that. That one seemed kind of obvious. Special diets, we could cater to various dietary restrictions like vegetarian, vegan, keto, gluten-free, and more. You could literally say cooking for groups of people and then have one of your categories literally just be special diets. And then the subcategories under that could be some of these vegan, vegetarian, keto, etc., gluten-free. Event and party planning. So we could talk about hosting these large gatherings, menu ideas, seating arrangements, and decor. We haven't included some of those things. Budget-friendly cooking. We could have a whole section on how to, how to cook for a group of people without breaking the bank. Seasonal and holiday cooking. That's something we kind of include, but we could group our articles that way. Cooking for specific occasions. Maybe weddings, birthdays, and reunions. We do some of that too, but our articles, once again, aren't grouped that way. Notice how I'm getting all these top level categories and within those, it's actually already telling me what some of those subcategories should be. Cooking for special occasions, subcategories, weddings, birthdays, reunions, corporate events. Boom, I have four subcategories under this one category and now I could write a whole cluster of content around cooking for corporate events or birthdays or weddings. I could do a cluster in each one. Food presentation, that's a great one for cooking for groups. Uh, kitchen equipment and tools, cooking for kids, food safe. I have more ideas here than I will ever have time to create all the content for. Unless I just have AI write all the content, which I don't actually recommend. I think that humans should be involved in the creation process. So don't get too overzealous with the use of the AI. Use it to help, but don't have it replace you. So that's free. But then you might say, well, but the keyword research tools will give me specific search queries I should try to rank for. Specific questions people are asking, keywords. Give me the keywords. All right, let's ask ChatGPT to help us with that. I'm asking it, please give me some specific search queries people are likely to search when they are planning to cook food for a corporate event. Oh, wow, look, it just gave me 20. These, these, these cover a range of topics that people might be interested in when planning for a corporate event. Corporate event menu ideas for a large group. So menu ideas, oh, great. How to calculate catering quantities for a corporate event budget-friendly catering options for corporate events, best appetizers for corporate events. Any one of these would probably make for a pretty good article. <laughs> then you say, but Ricky, the keyword research tools, they give me search volume numbers. They give you a number. What those numbers actually represent in reality is very questionable. That's because they only give you numbers based upon a subset, a small sample, very small sample, of all of the searches that are actually happening on the web. And because of that, all of these searches that are kind of being done a smaller number of times, you know, there's a lot of those searches that are gonna be, that are being done by a ton of people every single day. And then there's ones like this that are just, I mean, even if a thousand people search something a month, that's a pretty small number of people compared to the total number of searches being done. And because of that, these searches that aren't being done as often as the huge ones, are gonna always be underrepresented in the sampling. You have a very high likelihood 
that it's going to either dramatically overestimate the total number of searches or dramatically underestimate. And more often than not, I find that a lot of these search queries are going to say zero search volume and you're just not going to write them, even though there may be hundreds of people who are searching those every single month. And everybody using those tools is missing out on the huge opportunity to just write and rank for these articles. That means less competition for you. So realistically, take these and write the articles that make sense that somebody would actually have that question and forget about what those tools say. Once you've written 10 articles in this cluster and 10 articles in two or three other clusters, guess what you have? 30 to 40 articles. And then guess what you can do? That's right, Google Search Console. And there we can start to expand the topics that we're writing about and find those ones where there's some real huge search volume opportunity. And we can also always come back to our giant list here and pick our next subcategory that we want to tackle and start writing 10 or so articles in that one. And then of course use Google Search Console to continue to help navigate our keyword research going forward. There's no reason for almost anybody to be spending a bunch of money on a keyword research tool. I do not have an ax to grind, by the way, with any of these companies. I'm an affiliate for some of them. <laughs> and so I could be shooting myself in the foot because I could be telling you how badly you need each one of these tools. But instead, I decide to tell you the way that I see it, which is you can use these tools and do it for free, or you can do search analysis the way we've always been doing it and the way that I taught you in this video. Go check that one out too if you haven't. It's also free and all the methods are too. I hope to see you in our next video.